In this video, we will talk about klebsch gordon coefficients. We'll discuss their definition and explain how to use them. klebsch gordon coefficients are named after the German mathematicians Alfred Klebsch and Paul Gordon. The coefficients are defined like this. klebsch gordon coefficients are the expansion coefficients of total angular momentum eigenstates in an uncoupled tensor product basis. Let's talk about the physics first before we dive into the mathematics. klebsch gordon coefficients arise when we couple two angular momenta. That could be orbital angular momentum or a spin, for example. Since it works the same, we will use the letter j for this video. So we start with two angular momenta, j1 and j2, with respective magnetic quantum numbers m1 and m2. The physical process that's happening now is that j1 and j2 coupled to the total angular momentum j with magnetic quantum number m. In order to describe this mathematically, we need klebsch gordon coefficients. To illustrate the definition, we take the example of coupling two spin one-half states. Since they are independent states, we connect them with a tensor product, so that there are four possible configurations. These four states together are the uncoupled tensor product basis mentioned in the definition, or product basis for short. In the case of spin one half, we usually abbreviate them by just writing m1 and m2 using an up arrow for plus one half and a down arrow for minus one half. Due to the rules of quantum mechanics, the total angular momentum j can have values between the absolute value of j1 minus j2 and j1 plus j2. So j can be 0 or 1. Denoting the states by j m, we again have four possibilities. These are the total angular momentum eigenstates in the definition or coupled basis for short. If we now ask what's the connection between the product basis and the coupled basis, the answer are the klebsch gordon coefficients. Since both sets of states are normalized, there must be a unitary transformation that connects them. For this particular case, it can be represented as a 4 times 4 matrix, where the entries are the klebsch gordon coefficients. And with the commonly used condon shortly phase convention, one can assume the klebsch gordon coefficients to be real, making this an orthogonal matrix. The mathematical version of the definition looks like this. We start with the state Jm and insert a complete set of states in the product basis. This bracket thing here are the klebsch gordon coefficients, which now act as expansion coefficients of the product basis. If we start, for example, with the coupled state 1, 0, we can expand this as C1 up up, plus C2 up down, plus C3 down up, plus C4 down down. The numerical values for C1234 are given by the klebsch gordon coefficients. So how do we work with klebsch gordon coefficients? First off, we don't have to derive them every time we want to use them. Instead, when working on a problem, you should always refer to some table of klebsch gordon coefficients. We'll show you in a different video how to derive them, but that's really just for fun or educational purposes. Now a great resource for klebsch gordon coefficients is the annual review by the Particle Data Group, which we linked in the description. It looks a bit intimidating at first, because there is just so much information packed into only one page, but we will go step by step. Remember that we want to find the klebsch gordon coefficient j1m1, j2m2, jm. If we look at the notation table in the upper right corner, we see that the uncoupled product states are written on the left of a table, coupled states are written on top of the table, and also that we always have to include a square root, since this was omitted to improve readability. The procedure to find a klebsch gordon coefficient has four steps. First, we identify which j1 and j2 couple. This helps us choose the correct table on this page. Second, we identify which m1 and m2 couple. This helps us choose the correct row inside a table. Third, we identify the jm in the coupled basis, which helps us choose the correct column. And four, we put a square root over that value. However, if there's a minus sign, we put that outside the square root. Time for some examples. Let's say we want to find the klebsch gordon coefficient 3 halves, 1 half, 1, 1, 5 halves, 3 halves. Step 1. We need the 3 halves 1 table. Step 2. We look at the 1 half 1 row. Step 3. Look at the 5 halves 3 halves column. The value is 3 over 5. 
Step 4. Use the square root. The result is the square root of 3 over 5. Next, we want to find 1 minus 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. Step 1. Use the 1, 1 table. Step 2. Look at the minus 1, 1 row. Step 3. Look at the 1, 0 column. Step 4. Include the square root. The result is minus 1 over the square root of 2. Finally, let's find 2 minus 1, 2, 1, 4, 2. Step 1. Use the 2, 2 table. Step 2. Use the minus 1, 1 row. Step 3. Look at the 4, 2 column. But there is no 4, 2 column here. At least it looks that way. To be very explicit, all entries here should be filled with zeros, but they have been omitted to save space. So if we look at where the minus 1, 1 row and the 4, 2 column meet, we find a zero. Therefore, this Klebsch-Gordon coefficient is zero. Again, since this is important, if you have a Klebsch-Gordon table like this, it's actually a square matrix, in fact, the orthogonal matrix we mentioned earlier, which means that there are hidden zeros everywhere else. Last but not least, the fact that we're dealing with an orthogonal matrix means that we can use the same coefficients to go the other way as well. So you can ask how a coupled state can be expressed in terms of product states and how can a product state be expressed in terms of coupled states. And that's pretty much it for Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Thanks for watching.